I'm Dan Snow. Welcome to Voices of the First World War. In the years leading up to the centenary of the war, the last of those who actually experienced it have passed away. But the Imperial War Museums and the BBC had recorded interviews with many veterans to try to capture what it was like to actually be there. This series listens to those stories. Dawn broke, and it was a wonderful sight to see all these ships twisting and turning, zigzagging, with the battle cruisers ahead, one ship in front of the other, with a distance apart of about 250 yards. When we got to sea, we, we grasped to the various signals that it was rather more than an ordinary sweep you begin to realise something is on. It was one of the most dramatic moments of the First World War. It was also fast-paced, confusing, and for many, quite unexpected. We, the battle cruisers, were at sea from the Firth of Forth, and there was nothing much going on, so the hands were given a make and mend, have a doss down, have a lie up. I had a nice little sleep on the quarterdeck. The visibility was poor. Misty, North Sea Mist, you know, more or less throughout the battle, really. We didn't know anything was around, no excitement at all. But half past three, tea was piped for the, for the hands. I woke up and sloped off towards the gun room, where I hoped to get a cup of tea, and almost immediately, and hardly got up, when the bugles went, immediate action. Cruisers eventually got information from a ship called the Galatea, that enemy was in sight. That meant instead of having a fat-headed tea, I had to run off as fast as I could to my action station. That was just after half past three. On the afternoon of the 31st of May 1916, Britain's mighty navy clashed with the German high seas fleet in the first major sea battle for over a hundred years of Royal Navy history. It was the Battle of Jutland, fought amid sea mists and poor intelligence, which meant that from the admirals down to junior midshipmen, it was hard to make out what was going on at the time and now, 100 years later. It's about half past three in the afternoon when we steamed towards the German fleet, six battle cruisers, Admiral Beatty leading. And uh, a message came through that the flags was entangled round the mast, something must go up. So I took my sea boots off, Climbed out the poor top, went up the Jacob's Ladder, right to the very top. I unfurled the flag and I sat on the wireless yard, looking around. I could see all the German fleet. I made out roughly 40 ships. There were six of us. Those six ships were battle cruisers, under the command of Admiral Beatty, who was surging ahead on his flagship, HMS Lion. With them were four super dreadnought battleships, but they were lagging ten miles behind and could not support the group of battle cruisers which were now charging straight after the German fleet. It was the Germans who were first to fire at 348. The first attempt since Trafalgar to decisively defeat the Royal Navy was underway. John Ouvry was on HMS Tiger, a battle cruiser alongside Admiral Beatty. They opened fire on us and almost immediately they straddled us. In other words, they, they got the correct range. We opened fire at 14,000 yards, which was too far. BT made a signal close near the enemy, which we did. Signaller C. Farmer was aboard HMS Indefatigable, among the group of six battle cruisers. J.J. Hazelwood was on HMS Warspite, one of the super dreadnoughts that had fallen behind and was desperately trying to catch up. My station was in B turret. We were all closed up, just waiting for the word go. We were keen, this was the day we were waiting for. Many of our witnesses were stationed within turrets on battleships and battle cruisers, and worked like automatons, firing and reloading. They couldn't see what was going on outside, but they were also protected from splinters of steel from exploding shells. You're simply in a steel box. The box completely surrounds you, 
with thick armour plating all round, one feels that while you are in these turrets, and you are naturally cut off from anything going on outside, except the fact that you are in telephone communication with the bridge and the control towers. In contrast, signaller C. Farmer was still up the mast of HMS Indefatigable, very much exposed, when a shell hit the ship just after four o'clock and sent a sheet of flame down into the magazines. It was a terrific explosion. The guns went up in the air just like matchsticks, 12-inch guns they were, bodies and everything. And with about half a minute, the ship turned right over, threw me in the water, I was 180 foot up, you understand, and I was thrown well clear of the ship, otherwise I wouldn't have been sucked under. And the best I came to the top of the water, there was nothing to be seen, only the 5th Battle Cruiser Squadron coming along. They started open fire. German shells, which were dropping short, I could feel myself in the water, my feet, legs were going like that. Over a thousand men were lost on the Indefatigable. Farmer was one of two survivors. He remained in the water for hours while the battle raged on around him. There was another fellow there named Green, Jimmy Green, I think it was. And we swam over, we got a piece of wood. He was on one end, I was on the other end. And a couple of minutes afterwards, some shells come over. Jimmy was mine as his head. He went, so I was left on me lonesome. Beatty's squadron was battered, but behind them, the Grand Fleet under Admiral John Jellicoe was also at sea. And soon, Beatty's super dreadnoughts would be in range of the German fleet and roar into action. J.J. Hazelwood was on the super dreadnought war spite. Bang went the first salvo, away to the enemy. And off we started. Working in rhythm, the shells and the cordite coming up from below, being put into the guns, and they were kept firing as quick as possible. But the six battle cruisers would soon be four. A.J.E. Blackmore was serving as a rangefinder on HMS New Zealand alongside the Queen Mary. We heard an explosion, but what it was I couldn't say. But her fore turret started to dip in the fourth part of the ship. Then quite suddenly we passed through some dense smoke, black smoke. I thought it was a gas shell that exploded somewhere, and I shouted out on gas masks, but it wasn't a gas shell at all. It was, in fact, the smoke of the Queen Mary, the battle cruiser ahead of us, blowing up. The German shell exploded and set off the cartridges and so the shells. This vast quantity of explosive blowing up split the ship in two. She, she must have been down in almost seconds. And as she got abreast of us, she was right over. There were a few men that had jumped off the stern into the water onto a carry float. I couldn't see anything, as you might say, round the ship down in the water. There's too much smoke about anyway, and a smoke of our own guns going off. Like the indefatigable, the Queen Mary had been vaporised. The shattered remnant went down with more than 1,200 men. It slowly dawned on appalled British officers that German gunfire was more effective than their own. Those in turrets, like William Fell and J.J. Hazelwood, both on HMS Warspite, knew little of the bigger picture, experiencing the battle from inside their steel cage. There was a most monumental crump. It sounded like all the tin tea trays in the world full of crockery being dropped on our heads. The old ship shook and rattled. From then onwards, about every minute, I should think, we caught a packet from somewhere. Crash, rattle, bump, thump. And there was an even worse one than usual, which knocked us all off our perches. We were up on stools doing these various plots. We were all knocked flat and our backs down in the bottom of the deck. Suddenly, for no reason at all, we stopped firing. The trainers and gun layers looked into their telescopes. And they said, the ship is turning round. Presently they said, she's still turning round. She's going round in circles. And the word was then passed from the bridge that the rudder was jammed 
and that was the reason why the ship had stopped firing. I frankly don't know much of the next few minutes, but I sat up in water, almost complete darkness, and the worst of all was a complete silence. No sounds of engines, no sounds of action or anything going on at all. Just horrible silence, except for swishing water. And after a moment or two, I noticed that down all the voice pipes was coming a good old sluice of water, squirting down into the TS, and we were slowly flooding up. Eventually, they managed to clear the rudders after we had been within 7,000 yards of the enemy who were concentrating their fire on us. After that, it was just a case of waiting. We waited and we waited for an hour and a half until we heard banging on the armoured hatches above us and somebody let us out. I didn't recognise the ship when I came out and went up on the deck. She was just a shambles. She was in an awful mess. Every single boat had gone, splinters just everywhere. Funnels were riddled, falling down. And the captain turned to me and he said, How do you like that, boy? I said, Not much, sir. Some German battleships close us in the failing light and open fire on us. And I so remember seeing the flashes of the German guns firing and wondering whether the shell was on its way to blow me up. <laughs> they weren't. But I wondered whether I'd actually seen the gun fire which was going to cause me to pack up. The German fleet fled from the British as dusk enveloped the battlefield. Jellicoe was cautious about pursuing them in murky conditions. Smaller ships blundered into each other, exchanged ferocious fire and lost contact. Signaller C. Farmer was still in the water at 3am, clinging to wreckage. Pitch dark, giving up all hopes practically. I let go once. Yes, I let go once. I struggled back again quick. And uh, all of a sudden I could hear something coming towards me, a noise. And I had to gaze up and there was a German destroyer. Two sailors got down, picked me up, dragged me aboard the boat. I don't remember nothing till next morning. They were sponging me down, getting the oil fuel off me. And uh, all of a sudden the skipper came down, the German captain. And I asked him, I says, water. And he sent one of the hands up aloft and he came back with a bottle of whiskey, which was McAllister of Dundee. Farmer would be taken to Wilhelmshaven as a prisoner of war and found that in the naval barracks there, they were celebrating a victory. To some, it did look like a German success. Their fleet had inflicted greater losses on the British. But in fact, the German battleships had fled back to base and did not put to sea with the intention of taking on the British for the whole of the rest of the war. A British strategic victory then, but it was not the overwhelming annihilation that everyone in Britain had expected. People were confused. I saw the stern of a ship sticking out of the water and alongside the bows of the same ship sticking out of the water. I thought it was a German ship. I felt quite sure it was a German ship. So I passed my six-inch guns cruise. The wreck of a German ship is now in view on the starboard side. And the six-inch cruise gave a great cheer. Two minutes afterwards, the signal boatswain on our bridge rang me up. He said, did you see that ship on the starboard side? I said, yes, I did. And he said, did you read the name of the ship on the stern? It was invincible. That meant it was our battle cruiser flagship. <laughs>